Great. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Christina. Um, I'm a member of the executive board for the Missoula County Democrats. Thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you to all of our candidates, Zoe Zephyr, Dave Steverson, Andy Nelson, Bob Carter, Andrea Olson, Tom Steenberg, Jonathan Carlin, <clears throat> and Linda Swanson. Thank you to our moderator, Kim Dudick. And thank you to MCAT, which is broadcasting and streaming um, this forum on its Facebook page. This forum is sponsored by the Missoula County Democrats. The Missoula County Democrats believe that an informed public is critical to the success of our democracy. And thank you all for taking the time to listen and inform yourselves tonight. If you have, any, if you have time, please stop by at the table outside and sign up for the email list or consider buying tickets for our upcoming Williams, Day, uh, Williams Dinner on June 4th at Karis Park. This dinner is a fundraiser for the Missoula County candidates and we have a number of crucial legislative races this year in our county. We're excited to welcome Jennifer Palmieri uh, as our keynote speaker for that. I would like to just begin our time together by acknowledging that here in Missoula we are on, in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. Um, my tribe is from Vancouver Island and what we like to do back home is when we enter into someone else's territory uh, we ask for permission to come onto that territory and be a part of that, um, that area. And so uh, this is the traditional Aboriginal territory of the Salish and, or the uh, Kalispell and <clears throat> Salish people. So uh, they have given us this language. We thank them, the Salish Kalispell Cultural Council, for the uh, honor we honor the path that they have always shown us in caring for this place and for generations to come. And we thank them for the above language as we know and acknowledge all the indigenous inhabitants in Western Montana. As part of this acknowledgement, we situate ourselves as guests actively working against colonialism and injustice. I think the people of Turtle Island, the first people for the privilege of learning in this space. Um, a couple other announcements that we want to make. Ranked choice voting. voting does have QR, QR codes on the tables. They'll be around on the tables. They look like this. Um, and they'd love to hear from you. So just feel free to take your phone and scan that and answer their uh, questions in the poll. Also, there will be an informal gathering at the Union Club following this forum for anyone who wants to continue this conversation. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Kimberly Dudick. Uh, Kimberly has 20 years of social justice experience as an attorney protecting citizens' rights and enforcing our laws fairly as a registered nurse and as an advocate for survivors of domestic violence. She represented the people of, of Missoula County for eight years in the Montana House of Representatives, championing reforms to human trafficking, criminal justice, and child protection laws. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over. Thank you. <coughs> No? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. It's great to come together and see some of the good Democrats tonight. It's a lovely day in Missoula Valley. Good evening to our candidates. We're fortunate to have a lot of great candidates sitting up here with me. The goal of tonight's forum is for our community to meet the Democratic candidates for the legislative districts in Missoula County who have primary contests. So that's what you're seeing up here. These are the ones you're going to vote for in the primary. Before we get to our panelists, though, there are other candidates for office in the audience tonight, and I'd like to take a few minutes just to recognize them, have them stand and introduce themselves. Just names and districts, please, or we might be here for a while. Oh, I just saw one walk in. Why don't you go ahead and stand and introduce yourself? <laughs> Hi, I'm Representative Marilyn Marler. I'm running for re-election to uh, House District 90, which is the South Hills of Lewis and Clark neighborhood. Thanks for coming out, everybody. Thank you. Devin, why don't you go ahead? Hi. Uh, Devin Jackson. I'm running for House District 97, which is Lolo, Woodman, uh, Elmar Estates, all the way out to Alberton. It's giant. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a winnable district that would be a flip if you went to, so that's great. And next, I see Willis Curdy in the crowd. Willis, you want to stand up and introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Willis Curdy. I represent, uh, currently represent House District 98. I am a candidate for Senate District 49, which includes just what Devin said and my old house in 98. And um, good luck, everybody. Thanks, Wallace. All right, next, um, Sukami Keo, go ahead. 
Hello everyone. It's a beautiful night tonight and I wish you all the best. Um, I'm Connie Keogh, uh, Representative Connie Keogh. I am the representative for House District 91. And if you would just look over that way to University <laughs> Avenue and on up that way to the, uh, to the Rattlesnake, that's the area I cover. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Mark Bain, would you like to go ahead? Thank you. I appreciate you all being here tonight. Uh, my name is Mark Fain. I currently represent House District 99, and I'm running for re-election. House District 99 uh, is the south side of Missoula, uh, around the fairgrounds to Larchmont Golf Course, and then Linda Maloney Ranch. Thank you. Are there any other candidates here? I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mr. Everyone hiding in the corner. Um, as Trey Howell, I'm running for House District 95, which is the west side, the west side of downtown, and the riverfront and the river road neighborhoods. Thank you, Esme. And I see a couple of people who are not running for re-election, but they are legislators. I'd just like to recognize them also. Danny Tannenbaum, you want to stand up and just um, introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Danny Tannenbaum. I currently represent House District 95. Thanks, Gary. Hi, excuse me. I'm running for House District 92 as a Democrat. My name is Gary Stein. I run up to Condon through East Missoula, Potomac, all the way down to Tura. Thanks for your support. Thanks for being Gary, here. Gary, I am so sorry that I That's didn't right. recognize you before we had you. met before. Thank you so much for standing up and introducing yourself. Thank you. And um, Diane Sands, did you want to stand up? Senator Diane Sands, uh, termed out. Willis, you need, he needs your support to replace me. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you. All right, I think that's everyone. Yes. Great. All right, so um, audience, while the candidates are speaking, feel free to write down questions on the note cards um, that you got as you came in. Did everybody receive a note card? Or you know where they are? You can write down your questions. You'll have a chance. Um, we may not get to all of them, but we will try. And um, let's see. Is it, do you guys need a note card? Does anyone need one? All right. All right, we see right there. Anybody else need a note card? We'll kind of make sure they come your way. All right. All right, so we'll pick these up in about 15 to 20 minutes, so about 6.30. So if you have something burning, write it down now, or you may not have a chance to turn it in. And you'll just have a few minutes to think about your questions. Now, candidates, for the questions that I'll be asking, I am trying to keep to a tight time limit so we can cover all the topics we planned and there's a lot of candidates here. So in the back, oh we didn't really orange this, in the back you'll see somebody holding a red paper and yellow, oh good. Yellow paper means that um, you have 15 seconds left, you'll have a minute to answer each question. So um, plan accordingly. Yes, I saw Andre, you looked concerned. <laughs> plan accordingly, say the important things first. And she'll raise the yellow when there's 15 seconds, and when there's red, I'll have to ask you to stop. Please, please nicely stop, everyone. It'll be good. Um, so thank you for helping us stay on time. And we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. So first, candidates would like to introduce you to all the audience. As a starting point, we want to know who you are as people, what experiences shaped your core values, and what pushed you toward a life of public service. So let's start with something personal. We're going to start, we'll, we're going to do this kind of round round. We'll start this way and then we'll go down. We'll start, start with Tom Steenberg. And why don't you start with telling us a little bit about who you are. You have one minute. OK. It's not coming from your time yet. Test, test, There you test. go. Is it working? Yeah. Hello, my name is Tom Steenberg. And uh, I was privileged to serve as the city fire chief uh, and had a wonderful career at the Missoula Fire Department. After that career, I was recruited to run for the legislature and I, did, and I served for a couple terms in the state house. Uh, most recently, my good friend and our former state senator, Bryce Bennett, asked me to run for his seat when he had to leave Missoula and Montana for the first time for greener pastures. So currently, I'm serving as Senator for Senate District 50. And as a personal, personal note, in my last 15 seconds, firefighting is the best job in the world. You get to work with great people and do something that's bigger than yourself. Thank you very much. 
right, now, Andrea, why don't you go ahead and just start by telling us a little bit about who you are. Who am I? Is it on? Okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I am Andrea Olson. I was born, raised, and educated here in Missoula, Montana. Uh, my roots run deep. Uh, I still live within a couple of miles of where I was born and raised, but I have visited 22 countries. And I only mention that because uh, I have a lot of experience uh, in a wide variety of things. I've been a lawyer for 40 years. Um, 30 of those I was representing folks uh, really trying to make the system work for everyone. And then I kind of looked up and realized, oh my gosh, it's not working for almost anybody anymore, the system. And so, um, anyway, I worked at the legislature and then I ran for the legislature and served eight years in the Montana House and that's why I'm running for the Senate. I'm termed out of the House and running for my district I live in in the House. Thank you. And before we move on to the next ones, Tom and Andrea, could you just tell us again what district it is you're running for so everyone knows? Would you uh, uh, Thomas said I can speak for both of us. We are both running for Senate District 50, which is the very center of Missoula, House District 100, and then runs, as Mark described, out to Linda Vista. All right. Thank you, Andrea. And next we'll go with Jonathan Carlin. Jonathan, why don't you go ahead and start by telling us a little bit about who you are. Sounds good. Thank you. And I'll just quickly say uh, I'm running for House District 96, which is North Reserve Street out to Houston, so kind of between Mullen Road and I-90. So uh, we're in that area. So I'm currently a Boone and Crockett Wildlife Conservation Fellow at the University of Montana. And so I work on kind of natural resource policy, sort of trying to work on solving problems kind of that lie at the interface of climate and energy and wildlife, land use. And so that's sort of where I, you know, what I do on a day to day. But part of what inspired me to run was that I've had some unique opportunities in government to see how, how policy works on the state and federal level and see where it doesn't work. I got to work as a caucus leader with the Democratic majority in the U.S. Senate, and I got to work as a, as a, um, uh, with the Congressional Affairs Office of the U.S. Forest Service, and then did some work in the legislature, and seeing where, where kind of this extremism that's gripping a lot of our state and country is, 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 is hurting people, and that's kind of what inspired me to run. Thank you, Jonathan. And next we'll have Linda. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little about yourself, Linda. I'm Linda Swanson. I was born and raised in Great Falls, Montana. Um, I came here to go to the University of Montana. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, and I earned my master's degree in um, communicative disordered sciences. <laughs> so I'm a speech language therapist in the public schools. Um, I wanted to run because I was very disappointed in the last legislative session. I didn't feel like it represented um, true Montanans. And so I wanted to go there and be a voice um, for the people of Montana um, and stand up for our values and the things um, that we feel are important. Um, I've spent my life advocating for other people, whether it was um, adults with disabilities um, or children or youth in foster care. Um, and if I um, go uh, to the legislature, um, I plan on continuing that and advocating for the people that I represent. Thank you, Linda. I think you guys keep it on that side. Hey, now let's go ahead and Zoe, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about who you are. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Zoe Zephyr. I work at the University of Montana and have for the last seven years. Um, I work in the provost office currently where I oversee program review and curriculum approval. Before that, I worked, I managed their biology grad programs. I also taught composition and creative writing at the university. And when I'm not doing that in non-pandemic times, I also teach Lindy Hop, um, one of my students here. Uh, I'm also a trans woman, and I do human rights activism across the state and country. Uh, sometimes that means helping individuals who have faced discrimination find justice. Sometimes it's working with city council to propose new human rights legislation to protect our communities. It means testifying before the legislature, meeting with the governor's office, and uh, across the country when uh, Governor Abbott in Texas sent CPS after trans kids to take them away from their families, I worked with those families to raise funds and find states to relocate 
where they would be safe. Thank you, Zoe. Next, we'll have uh, Dave Severson. Go ahead, Dave. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Dave Severson. Uh, I uh, lived in Missoula and Montana most of my life. I taught uh, journalism and uh, government, social studies at Sentinel High School for 22 years. Uh, and after that, that was a great career working with kids. I learned a lot. Um, and uh, after that, I worked for the union uh, as the local president and then a field consultant for the state union. And in that job, I learned a lot about uh, mediation, negotiations, uh, and essential skills uh, in solving disputes between people in difficult situations. Uh, those are going to be essential skills in the legislature. I've also served on uh, some state boards, the state labor board, uh, the state pension board, and I was appointed as a representative uh, to House District 89 for a year. Uh, so I, I know a little bit about the duty and uh, want to continue my service. I'm retired, uh, so I want to uh, devote full time uh, to constituents and uh, service in the legislature. Thank you, Dave. Next we'll have... Uh all right, next, Andy Nelson, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about who you are. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. My name is Andy Nelson. I'm running for House District 98. I grew up in northeastern Montana in Culbertson, up on the High Line, and I moved here to Missoula in 2011 to attend school at the University of Montana. I majored in history and political science, and um, upon graduation, I wanted to work in nonprofits, and that was about the time I came out as a gay man. And I found myself working for the Western Montana LGBTQ Plus Community Center here in Missoula, Montana. And now I serve as the executive director. And a big focus for me is human rights, specifically LGBTQ rights. Um, I'm a very community involved person. I serve um, as the service chair of the Missoula Sunrise Rotary and soon to be president elect and um, I'm also passionate about peace building and I work with the folks at Jeanette Ranka Peace Center, Run Wild Missoula, and I hope to be a voice for my generation, renters, and folks that care about Montana. All right, go ahead, go ahead Bob, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am Bob Carter. I was born and grew up in Montana in Great Falls. I grew up working on farms and ranches out in the eastern central part of the state. I, uh, when my wife Lori and I got married and decided we were going to have kids, we decided that one of us was going to dedicate ourselves to raising kids and doing community service. And she says, I'm sure you're going to have a great time and you'll do very well raising the kids. And so uh, for the last 15, 17 years now, my priority has been uh, kids education, early childhood education, uh, foster uh, families. My passions are uh, obviously education and outdoors, anything outdoors. I'm on several boards of directors for community and education uh, groups. I'm an 11-year board member for Target Range School. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm happy to be here. And my inspiration are other legislators that have gone before me, like uh, Dave Wozenried, obviously uh, Will Skurdy and Diane Sands. And uh, these are my passions. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> Excuse me. So next, we're going to start, and we'll start down on this end, but I'll have you swap. So this time, Andrea, you'll go first. Okay? So um, when did you first contemplate public service and running for office? Was there an event or person that inspired this for you? Um, thank you for the question. And I, first, I want to thank everyone for being here. I started, I ran for office when I was a student at the University of Montana, and I was on Central Board for a, a couple of sessions, or a couple of years, um, and I actually, we did quite a few things. I mean, we helped create the International Fair, we looked at curriculum, we funded a lot of organizations, and I actually, after that, I went to law school, I decided I didn't want to do politics, but then in my legal career, I ended up lobbying for workers' rights for four sessions. And then um, I um, saw how the system really worked. And as I said, I looked up and the system wasn't working. And I decided then that it was time to run. I too was asked to run. And it was very synchronistic. And I want to 
uh, thank all those people who supported me, but particularly mention my mentor and friend, Carolyn, Senator Carolyn Squires, who represented uh, my district for almost 30 years. May she rest in peace. Thank you, Andrea. All right, Tom, when did you first contemplate public service and running for office, and was there an event or person that inspired this? You know, I grew up overseas in Japan. My father was a missionary, and so I grew up in public service. And when I came back to go to school here in the United States, it was kind of just assumed that most of us were going to go into some type of public service. Uh, unfortunately for my father, none of us became a minister, because that's, I think, what he really wanted. But uh, a couple of us ended up uh, working for the fire department. And uh, my other siblings are also in, in fields of public service. It's interesting because Carolyn Squires also inspired me, along with some other folks. But uh, when I was working for the Firefighters Union, she was instrumental in, uh, in developing my, my work in unions. Uh, as far as ending up at the legislature, I had a great career at the fire department. I was going to lobby at the state level for the firefighters. And when I became fire chief, that didn't happen. So I was happy to run for the legislature after that. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. All right, Linda, it's your turn now. Why don't you go ahead and tell us, when did you first contemplate public service and running for office? And was there an event or person that inspired this? I think I've always had a call for public service. I've always um, worked in positions um, where I served other people. Um, after college, I started my career working with adults with disabilities and did that for quite a long time. Um, after that, I took a position um, where I helped um, foster youth that were aging out of the system be able to transition successfully into adulthood. A lot of them don't have the same support as um, youth that are in their birth families. Um, after that, um, I took a break, raised my kids when they went back to school. I went to graduate school and now I work in the schools um, advocating for children with special needs. Um, so I think that's always been a heart of mine um, in, in advocating. Um, I specifically started to run this time because um, I was asked by um, my union to run. Um, and I wanted to step up and do that. Thank you, Linda. Go ahead and give it to John. And Jonathan, why don't you go ahead, same question. When did you first contemplate public service and running for office? And was there an event or person that inspired this? Yeah, so, yeah, so, I guess there's several events that have inspired me to run for office, but one example, I guess, recently is I've, for the last several years, have taught watershed science in our public schools, and I've had the opportunity to teach thousands of kids and get to know teachers really well in the process of it. And uh, in doing this, I'd get to see what sorts of needs there were in the classroom, what teachers were saying they felt like, what additional support that they wanted. Then, during the last legislative session, I worked on a bipartisan hunting and fishing bill, but in the process of that, I saw how, you know, it wasn't just that things were polarized or there were disagreements. It was, and you know, at the, I'll be very partisan in saying this, that, that there's a, a, a large contingent of the Republican Party that I think truly does not have the best interest of our state in mind, that is not thinking about helping teachers, that is not thinking about helping their constituents. They're, they're, they were more focused on stoking the culture wars than trying to make sure that the teachers that I got to work with had the funding that they need. And I think that we need to flip seats in the legislature, and House District 96 is a seat that we can and we will flip this year. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. All right, go ahead, Dave. Do you need me to repeat the question? No. All right, go ahead. Um, there you go. No? no. Oh, there you go. Um, I've kind of started uh, contemplating uh, legislative service probably at the very beginning of my career because I was always uh, public service oriented and my union uh, was always involved in lobbying the legislature. Um, so people that have inspired me, I can't pin it on one person, but students of course, because they were always very enthusiastic about following the news and being involved and writing stories and things. Uh, but legislators I've worked for in the past, many of them in this room, Marilyn, Diane, Mark, Connie, Willis and uh, Marilyn, uh, you you all have worked hard in the legislature, and I want to try and uh, follow up and um, 
do some of that. But basically, teachers and um, public employees and union members have inspired me all along the way. Whenever I talk with them, uh, I want to stay involved and, and do what I can uh, to help out. Thank you, Dave. And Zoe, why don't you go ahead? Dude. Um, so when I transitioned four years ago, it was not a question of will you be involved in public service? It was immediately, can you help the folks in your community who aren't as well off? And a lot of times uh, that activism feels like triage. You are helping people who um, individuals have harmed, who policies and governments have failed. And in the last several years, it's felt like those wounds were coming faster than our community could take care of our people. And so I started doing work with the city and saying, okay, I want to help write policy for Missoula. That's a friendly city. They should engage with this. And they did. And it was really nice to do that work. And then I went to the legislature. Like everyone here was frustrated with the bills that were being passed. And I went and specifically testified on trans rights. And it was like talking to people with their ears closed. And I met with people like Marilyn Marler and Senator Bryce Bennett. And I said, how do you move the needle on this conversation at the state level? And he said, good news is you can do it. The bad news is you've got to get in that room. And so I went, all right, let's do it. I'm running for office. Thanks, Zoe. I'm going to go ahead and pass that to Bob. And Bob, you go ahead and go first this time. My inspiration was probably Dave Wozniak in probably about 2009, 2010, when he and I went to Helena to carry a bill for our community uh, water district that I was a board member on. And uh, at the time, Dave said, you're going to end up doing this someday. And I said, no, I'm not. I said, early 2000s, I was really happy with the demographics of Montana and how we were mostly a democratic state. And as 2000s progressed and it slowly turned red, uh, and then 2016 came and I started knocking on doors for candidates. 2018, I was knocking on more doors. Same thing with 2020. And then uh, uh, I was super happy with our current legislatures, leg legislators in our district who was Senator Diane Sands and our Representative Wills Curdy. And uh, when they came up, when they were going to term out, they uh, came to me and said, you've been volunteering out here a long time. Now it's time for you to step up and do the same thing in, in uh, Helena. And so here I am. Andy, go ahead. All right. Um, I have to say I was first inspired um, to potentially run uh, when I was in high school, and that was in part due to my dad, who um, was on what is on the city council back in Culbertson. And I always enjoyed when he would come home at night and talk about what they talked about in the city council meeting that day. Um, so I'll give credit to my dad there. Um, and also, the, the 2008 election was a big push for me. I remember watching the TV with dad and just becoming really interested in politics. Um, when I came out here in 2011, I declared political science as my major right away and learned the ins and outs about how government works, but not how to run for office. That's one thing they do not teach you. But still very interested, and I knew when I got out of school that politics wasn't in my realm. I wanted to work in the nonprofit world, but after the frustration that I felt and so many others did from the 2021 legislature, I knew I needed to throw my hat in the race. So next question, um, would like to learn a little bit more about your plans for important issues that face Montana. We'll spend about 40 minutes on this, and for the audience, a couple of members will now come through and pick up the questions if you've written them down. Go ahead and, and lift up your card so they can see, and we'll use them in the next segment. So we'll start again. This time we'll start with Tom. Housing is the biggest expense most Montana households have, and the cost of housing have risen dramatically over the past few years. What are the most important things the state legislature can do to address housing affordability for regular people in Montana? The most important thing the state legislature can do for normal people in Montana is not pass legislation that hurts housing development. And uh, they did that last legislative session, and unfortunately, put more barriers in the way for affordable or workforce housing. What we need to do is, is use every tool at our disposal, and that includes uh, subsidizing people for housing, 
It also includes looking at our zoning regulations, which both the city of Missoula and the county of Missoula are doing right now, to make it easier for folks to build, developers and folks to build houses. We also need to look at subsidizing housing in, in, uh, in, from the standpoint of uh, credits for development. And fortunately, I think the legislature will do that next session. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Andrea, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Um, housing is really one of the most fundamental needs, the one of the most fundamental rights that people have. And in the wealthiest country, we have lots of tools available, and government does create policy that creates the economy that we live in. And I think that in order to address this housing crisis, we need to, one, remember that this housing crisis has been going on for actually a long time, depending on who you are. And I'd like to do a shout out and thank all the organizations that have been working on housing issues for people in Montana for a very long time, particularly homeward here in, in Missoula. Um, we need to look at all of the tools we've been using in all of those organizations and really extend them. So we need to increase the first-time home buyers um, benefits. We need to increase the homestead allowance. We need to increase wages. And we really need to look at all of the ways in which we, we have... Okay, so this is a question that cannot be answered in a minute, but my time is up. <laughs> You'll find there's many questions like that. All right, well, let me go. Jonathan, why don't you go ahead? Yes, I think housing is the number one priority that we have to address in, the legis in, in the legis this legislative session because it impacts every aspect of the economy. I mean, it, family, like, there's no more sort of escaping the housing crisis for people. And I'll just say the in-house district 96 in the Mullen Road area, the average home is selling for $520,000 and the, and the average household income is 52000 So that puts it into perspective. And I think what we need to do is have the legislature no longer take an adversarial role with local government. We have to see collaboration between the state and the local government so that the legislature can support things like bolstering Missoula's um, affordable housing trust fund, uh, community land trust, inclusionary zoning. I think we need to take an all of the above approach to see so that we no longer have it where Missoula's hands are tied when they're trying to work on zoning issues, when they're trying to, when, when our city council and county commissioners are trying to uh, alleviate our housing crisis and then they're being constrained by the legislature. So I think we need to see collaboration to take an all of the above approach. Thank you, Jonathan. Linda, why don't you go ahead and talk to us about it? Thank you. Um, all of you have spoken very well about that, um, about the issue. And I feel like Missoula has been thoughtful about it. They have been trying to plan for this. Um, but like Jonathan said, a lot of times their hands are tied and um, they're not able to do it. We do have to look at more dense um, housing developments, um, which is hard because that's not traditionally how we've built in our area, and it's hard to sometimes have those in our um, own communities. But in order to have places for everybody to live, which is indeed a very fundamental um, right that everybody, um, of everybody, and without that housing, it impacts everything um, in our city. Um, we, there's people that we desperately need to help serve us, um, mental health workers and nurses that can't afford housing here. And so we're not only losing out, um, not on the housing, but we're also losing those very important people. Thank you. I'm going to echo what Linda said and said everyone's talked so eloquently on this. Um, uh, for me, one of the big things about my district, in addition to inclusionary zoning, more dense development, I know Representative Tenenbaum brought forth something last session regarding duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes in single-family zoning areas. Um, but my district is about 40% renters. Um, and right now, there are four times as many Airbnbs in Missoula as there are long-term rentals available that artificially decreases the supply of rentals available. It means when houses go on the market, those 500 plus averages, are because we're not having houses go to Missoulians looking to put down roots in the community. They're going to folks looking to have investment properties. 
And so one of the low-hanging fruit for me is Airbnb regulations, um, making sure that if you have an Airbnb, we cap the number you have, we make sure it has to be in the county of your primary residence, and then beyond that, because I'm running out of time, uh, landlord-tenant regulations, uh, no cause eviction, stop them. Dave, why don't you go ahead? Well, um, I agree with everything that's been said so far. <laughs> Great ideas. Uh, and Zoe, uh, too, about uh, the Airbnbs. That's one idea I had that uh, if you're going on vacation, uh, you're likely to not care about the taxation on your vacation rental. So users of Airbnbs and owners of Airbnbs should be taxed at a higher rate. Um, all of the other ideas uh, are, are things that I would using the toolbox and I was quite surprised that the legislature got in the way of innovations of local governments. Uh, the local government here especially, uh, Homeward, I got to go to a workshop uh, and they had all kinds of innovative solutions, land trusts, co-ops, things like that that we should use in, in every way. And we really need to address our whole tax structure, property tax, uh, and unfortunately we've, we've been in a perfect storm of unfortunate uh, circumstances with housing prices. But I think if we are allowed as a local government to use all those tools, we can make some progress in this. Thank you. Andy, why don't you go ahead and talk to us now? All right. Um, great job, everybody. Um, I think what's most important is the legislature just recognized that our state is in a housing crisis, right? And every location in Montana is different. Missoula's housing crisis is different than Culbertson's housing crisis, and we need to address those based on the local level. Um, many of us went on a housing solutions tour put on by Homeward and some other nonprofits working in this area, and one thing that stood out to me is learning how long the permitting process takes from the point of time that the paperwork gets put on this desk from point A to point B, it can take three years before the ground is um, dug. Um, so speeding up the permit process, very important. Um, also, I'm a renter, you know, this isn't just affecting homeowners, it trickles down to the renters, and we are lacking in rental availability. I also believe we should put a cap on the number of Airbnbs in our city. Thank you, Bob, why don't you go ahead? What they said. <laughs> No, but everybody brought up a, a single point and uh, development and, and addition to the different tools that we can use to get first-time home buyers in there. Uh, regulation of Airbnbs is super important. Uh, Andy's local control. What's appropriate in Carter County is not necessarily appropriate in Missoula County and being able to do that with the legislature. Uh, additional taxes on folks who can afford that. If you can afford a second home, uh, and, and you're using that as an income and uh, you're, you're getting around some taxes because you've got your Airbnb which is really making your property a commercial property then, uh, then you should be able to pay some extra taxes and help out there. The, the crisis that we're facing here is critical although everybody that I've talked to on the hundreds of doors I've talked to nobody's willing to, uh, willing to sell their house for less than the very maximum they can because They've been living in it, and that's their investment. Thank you, Bob. So, next question. Uh, Twelve tribal nations predate the establishment of Montana, yet indigenous peoples are overrepresented in the criminal legal system. Oh, and they also experience health and safety disparities due to lack of resources. How do you plan to use your position to encourage fellow lawmakers to understand these complexities? In what ways will you work towards creating and fostering relationships with Montana's indigenous communities to set goals that can be achieved during your term? And Andrea, I think it's your turn to go first. Thank you. Um, this is a very important question. I was fortunate um, to work for uh, seven, eight years with uh, the Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes as an attorney. And I worked um, in other jobs in which I re was representing individual tribal members facing a system that is fundamentally unfair um, in everything from housing to the criminal justice system to uh, just the daily expectations that and the 
misconceptions that people have. So we've done, made some uh, significant progress by having the Indian Education for All Act passed because fundamentally we all need to learn more about the culture, history, the strengths, the power, and the rights of our indigenous communities. Um, yeah, and I have lots more to say on this subject, but my time is up. All right, Tom, it's your turn. I'm going to take over where Andrea quit there, and uh, the Indian education uh, for all is, is very important and, and uh, develops uh, more understanding. But every tribe that, we, that, that exists here in our state, we've got to remember a couple things. One, they were here first, and two, they're all different. And what we need to do as legislators and citizens is listen to those folks. Uh, things were going pretty well before we came along. And as far as the legislature goes, we also need to support these programs. Um, they couldn't be more different. Salish and Kootenai own, own a dam, and uh, the, uh, the Crow tribe owns a coal mine. And so they've all got different needs and different uh, ideas. We need to support them and, once again, fund those programs. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Linda, why don't you go ahead and take a hint of that? So I actually am um, fortunate to uh, work on a tribal reservation. Um, I work in St. Ignatius School, and uh, it's, it is hard. A lot of people live in poverty. Um, there are a lot of issues with um, drug and alcohol abuse. And so I feel like, you know, we need to support uh, mental health care. Uh, we need to support um, drug and alcohol rehabilitation. And I think the tribes are doing a great job of providing education. Uh, we have in Pablo uh, the Salish Kootenai College, and they are doing great and wonderful things. Um, so I think it's extremely important, and like you said, they were here before us, and I think they have very valuable opinions on our land um, and nature, and and we need they need to have a voice in what happens with their community. Thank you. Jonathan, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Yeah, this is a, a topic that I think is, um, there's so much opportunity here because when we think about what our goals are for the state of Montana, let's take renewable energy for an example, there's so many opportunities to partner with tribes and tribal leaders where we can, I think that there are a lot of shared goals and objectives. And so what I'd really like to see is the state be deliberate with making sure that whenever there are um, efforts to plan the future. There's, we're talking about what do we want to see uh, community, what do we want to see our state look like in 5, 10, 20 years, 50 years. We make sure that tribal leaders are there at that table so that we can see where there are opportunities for partnership. And there's so many examples in the natural resource field of co-management where we see tribes take the lead in managing natural resources. And what it does is it creates, it, you know, you basically foster within tribes ownership of resources and, and, the, and, and uh, unique opportunities, both economic and educational, to create, to, to let tribes determine what they want their future to look like. And I think the state should take an active role in, in, in doing that. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Right. Dave, um, go ahead. Okay. Um, I like the land acknowledgments that a lot of organizations like this one are doing uh, because it creates awareness for a white person like me as to our true history uh, and background. Uh, some of the most dynamic and interesting and helpful conversations I've had are with uh, Native American teachers uh, in the union, and we need to listen. Uh, education, Indian ed education for all was very helpful. Um, and uh, if you're at the Missoulian today, there's an example of systemic racism. Uh, the uh, census uh, undercounted Native American populations, which is going to dramatically uh, negatively impact some of the services they need from the federal government. So maybe we need to do a recount uh, in some areas uh, to uh, be fair. We need to really look at these uh, types of things uh, to uh, listen to uh, our uh, leaders in Native American communities. Thank you, Dave. Zoe, why don't you go ahead? 
Thank you. Um, I also want to uh, say that I appreciate the land acknowledgments, but I want to also acknowledge that those are signals and intentions that we set, and we need to make sure that we are following through on them uh, on the other end. And that can mean, yes, we have Indian education for all, which again is a signal, but we need to make sure we're delivering on that to the extent which we promised. Um, other issues, all of these like immunization and like activism, it starts at the community level. It starts listening to the communities. It means that listening to the legislators who are members of the Indian Caucus, let them take take lead and support them in ways that um, they deem to be um, reasonable. Um, and then it also means, speaking of my own hobby horse, that the Democratic Party needs to have a serious uh, reckoning with what we mean by land back. When we talk about this land belonging to the indigenous communities, what are we to make people willing to do? How are we willing to give this land back to the communities that it belongs to? Thank you. All right, and now Bob, go ahead and give us this time. So recognizing that the 1972 Constitution and the document that it is enshrined Indian education for all for our schools and stuff is an important first step, but it's also incredible to think that it took till 1972 to recognize that this was an issue and that we need to start moving forward with it. And then also recognizing that there's multi-generational issues and there's no way we're going to be able to solve that very quickly. And so what we need to really work on, in addition to what everybody said, is social services and safety nets for those who are helping out, in, and especially in multi-generational families, and uh, education education. I just came from uh, Science Olympiad in Bozeman and uh, touring the new facility on campus there and, uh, and the folks there said the best way that we can work on Indian Ed in Montana is higher education and primary education. Thank you. Andy, why don't you go ahead and you have the last word on this. All right. <sighs> yes, so we are living on stolen lands. And I believe we all need to have a deep understanding and learning of how colonization has um, affected families through historical trauma. I grew up um, six miles down the road from the Fort Peck, Assinib Fort Peck Indian Reservation, the Sioux Assin Assiniboine Reservation. Um, and you cross one side of the reservation boundary to the other, and it's like night and day of the difference of the living situation of folks. And for one, I believe we need to increase funding in many different areas, specifically in healthcare. Um, that same reservation is currently um, going through a syphilis outbreak, um, specifically with congenital syphilis. Um, babies are passing away before they're even birthed. Um, and so, in general, increased funding for s specific services like those. Thank you, Andy. All right. Um, we're going to mix up the order a little bit this time. So, everyone get excited. It'll be a little different. Now, um, we're seeing, thank you unprecedented attacks on human rights, both on reproductive health care, decision making, personal autonomy for some of us, and on LGBTQ plus Americans in state legislatures. What can Montana do to protect people from these assaults on their human rights? And Jonathan, we're going to start with you this time. Thank you for the question. So I think that there's several things that we can do, and, and I guess I'll start by saying there's so many issues that, you know, when we're thinking about what we want Montana to look like in the future, that that we can discuss. But I think human rights need to be at the need to be first and foremost, because we can't think about economic issues, we can't think about housing, climate change, unless we are living in a society where people have rights and where and where the role of government is to uphold and expand rights and not limit them. So I think one of the things that we need to do is is fight like hell, in. in during this next legislative session to protect our state constitution, to uphold the integrity of our courts, and not allow the Republicans to, to do what they want to do with our Supreme Court, changing the way judges are elected and, 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 and others. And we also need to win seats. I think we have to expand our majority to prevent a Republican super, we have to expand 
the number of seats Democrats have to prevent a Republican supermajority. Because when we do that, then we can prevent constitutional amendments and things like that. So those are my, my short answer. Thank you. Linda, go ahead. Uh, I agree with Jeff that it's a very important issue. Uh, I feel like um, certain minorities of people are being targeted, um, and I think it is uh, exceptionally unfair, and we should never hinder the rights and freedoms of anybody, and especially not be targeting anybody, um, including women, including LGBTQ+. Plus. Um, I have a daughter that is uh, trans male, and the thought of somebody telling me um, what I need, what I can do and not do to support my son um, is not okay. And I will not stand for it. Um, I think as a parent, that's our right um, to make that decision. Um, we know our youth, um, and we're working with medical doctors, and I don't think that anybody should ever be telling um, anybody what their rights should be. Um, I think that's individual. All right, thank you. Tom Steenberg, why don't you go next? I agree. LGBTQ rights are human rights. Nobody has the authority to tell somebody what to do. And women's reproductive rights are their personal choice. These are bedrock principles and I agree that we, we need to also keep our numbers so that our Constitution continues to protect us. Um, in a nutshell, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Andrea, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have a particular passion for human rights. I was fortunate enough to be a human rights fellow at the United Nations back in 1990. Um, I encourage you all to look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we must all remember that when one person is oppressed, we all are oppressed. When one person's rights are infringed, all of our rights are infringed. When we start attacking the right of privacy for a woman, in her personal decision to whether or not to have a child, a decision that should be made between herself, her God, her doctors, her family. Government should not be involved in that. In fact, it's government's obligation to protect, to honor, and to fulfill human rights. It is uh, government's obligation to make sure these rights are bestowed upon all of us equally. And if we haven't done that as government, we have failed. And I have spent 40 years trying to make sure that these rights apply better to everyone and now we are going backwards and uh, it will take all of us to protect all of our rights. Just a reminder, they may win the battle but they're going to lose the war. <laughs> yes, I will repeat the question. It will be, you vote first. Uh, we've seen unprecedented attacks on human rights, both on reproductive health care decision making and on LGBTQ plus Americans state legislatures, what can Montana do to protect people from these assaults on their human rights? Go ahead, Zoe. About abortion, I will say that it should be legal, accessible, affordable, and without stigma. Um, when it comes to LGBTQ rights, I want to acknowledge that there have been 250 anti-LGBTQ pieces of legislation introduced across America this year, over half of which directly targeted trans people. These are banning talking about us in grade school. It is taking people, just forcibly detransitioning people, um, and it is also taking children away from their parents. And if we want to talk sincerely about what Montana can do to protect those people, the answer is elect representatives who are queer, elect trans representatives. And the reason I say that is because 250 bills were brought forward. In states where trans women are elected to the legislature, zero of those bills have passed because it, is, because it is hard to turn someone into a boogeyman when they are sitting across from you talking infrastructure, talking tax. That's what Montana can do. Thanks, Zoe. Dave, why don't you go ahead and give us your answer? Um, all, all the attacks on people 
at the legislature this last session was the last straw for me, part of why I wanted to be involved. Um, I, I can't stand for attacks on our LGBTQ community. Uh, the anti-trans bills were horrible. Um, attacks on women um, were uh, inexcusable. Uh, I'm 100% pro-choice. Uh, I've seen kids bullied in school for who they are. I've defended workers who uh, were attacked by their administrators for who they are. And we have to work together. We have to defend uh, all human rights in the state. Um, these, these laws violate our Constitution. They violate uh, what most people believe. Uh, and I think we can rely on our Constitution for privacy rights and human rights uh, in Montana at least. So I'd really work to roll back some of those, those laws uh, that were passed last time. Thank you, Dave. And Andy, why don't you go ahead and answer for us? Um, these are two of the major issues that have motivated me to run for office. Um, watching the last legislative session go down, there were three anti-LGBTQ pieces of legislation that were passed, one of them being banning trans kids from playing sports, one of them being a Senate Bill 250, uh, the Religious Freedom Bill, which gave businesses the right to discriminate according to someone's sexual orientation or gender identity because of their religion and much more. Um, next session, we're going to see more and more of these attacks in Montana. Don't say gay bills, more anti-trans bills. We need more LGBTQ voices in the room, and I'm very happy to sit here alongside many others. So, um, and as far as abortion rights, abortion is health care. Growing up in the conservative area in eastern Montana, I did. I thought I was a, a pro-lifer um, until I realized that a good chunk of women in my family have had abortions, and they each had their own personal reason as to why. Abortion rights are human rights. Thank you, Andy. Bob, why don't you go ahead? Article 2, Section 10 of the Montana Constitution gives all Montanans the right to privacy, and those rights have been upheld by the Montana Supreme Court, and I think that we're in danger of losing some of those rights if another party gets a supermajority in either House or Senate of Montana. Uh, I couldn't say it any better than Zoe or Andy have said it, uh, but what I would say is that if guys were getting pregnant, this would not be an issue, especially middle-aged white guys. This would have been solved a long time ago, and we wouldn't be having this conversation still. But the fact that we're in the 2020s and we're still having this conversation, it's, it's amazing to me. And so. Uh, yeah, there's, there's nothing that you can do to, to try to get in between someone's health care decisions like, like something as important as that. And these are not choices that people take lightly. This is not something that someone does on a whim. This is life-changing choices that are super important. And it's between those people, not us deciding for them. Thank you. And this time... With the next question, we'll start with Dave. So, um, Dave, which issues, and this applies for everyone, of course, not just Dave, which issues do you see yourself as an expert on, and if you're elected, which issues do you intend to introduce bills on in the state legislature? Well, uh, my background is in education, uh, so uh, that would be a strong area where I'd uh, want to work. Uh, teachers and staff in schools have uh, done a heck of a job uh, through the pandemic. Uh, and showing that uh, public schools and public uh, government uh, can really rise to the occasion. We need to uh, stabilize our schools through the pandemic uh, and uh, uh, really uh, get things back to normal for kids. Some kids have lost two years of learning. And so education would be one of my top priorities, uh, helping working families uh, with uh, greater unionization uh, uh, and um, that would be another priority, uh, increasing public pensions, uh, supporting them, uh, and there's quite a few other issues that uh, um, I'd like to get to public lands, and uh, those types of things would be some of my priorities as well. So um, lots, lots to tackle, uh, but I would just go with my areas of expertise in education and unions. Thank you, Dave. So we go ahead. 
those, I would focus on the areas I have lived firsthand experience in. Obviously, LGBTQ rights is one of them. I'll be meeting with a handful of uh, Solutions Caucus Republicans this summer who have expressed interest in opposing these types of bills and meeting with them to talk about statistics and information about that. Um, looking to end, uh, I'm looking to ban conversion therapy and end the gay and trans panic defense laws. Um, I'm also a renter in the district, and I would look, as I mentioned, for landlord-tenant laws, stopping no-cause evictions, increasing the amount of time uh, that you have to notify someone for price increases, the little things that make a difference to keep people in homes in Missoula. Um, Additionally, as I mentioned earlier, Airbnbs, I would look to bring forward Airbnb regulation, limiting the number and requiring people to be in the county. And then also, I am a member of the union as well and would be working on unionization efforts and am currently working on helping local organizations in Missoula unionize. Right. Thank you, Zoe. Linda, why don't you go ahead and go next? Like Dave, education is very important to me. I want to make sure that both um, public schools and um, our public services are protected and stay public. Um, I want to look at how can we supplement income for these because I don't feel like we can keep um, only um, providing substance for these uh, services through property taxes. Um, that's getting really hard to do and even though I support them when those come across it's really hard to check yes sometimes because I know what it's going to do to my bank account and I know other people feel that way too so um, looking at other ways um, using solar panels to decrease um, the cost to run our facilities um, putting taxes on some of um, kind of they call the sin tax, um, marijuana tax, or the sports gambling to help support those. I also um, am very passionate about voter rights and making sure that every person is able to make it to um, the ballot and, and vote if they want to do that. All right, thank you. And Jonathan, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So in terms of the areas that I have the most personal experience and educational experience in, be climate, energy, natural resources, land, wildlife, that's where I've spent the most time. I also have a degree in public administration and policy, so I feel pretty comfortable in a wide variety of policy areas. And Some of the areas that I am most excited about is housing, because like I said, I think housing impacts every facet of our state, and, we, and that's something that we have to address now. So housing with that, taxes and property taxes, and then sort of more broadly is how do we fund government services and provide adequate funding for critical government projects? I think that a huge amount happens during the appropriations process and mental health resources, for example. Where I, what I want to do is to really, you know, I enjoy a lot of, uh, you know, looking at budget tax type issues and think about what, what government services do we need to be funding more of, finding creative solutions to make sure those services are being funded. Bob, why don't you go ahead and take it up now? So, so my passion and expertise is in education, education funding. We need to figure out another way to fund education in the state of Montana uh, other than property taxes. Property taxes being the only mechanism for funding education is, is a horrible solution. And so uh, in addition to education and then trying to figure out early education. so. Uh, Pre-K education is going to be critical. Montana is 50th out of 50 states for their beginning teacher salaries. And, and kids are working down on Reserve Street at fast food places for more than what we can pay our teachers, our beginning teachers. And so that needs to be solved. Uh, Mid-career teachers who are up to uh, 40th out of 50 states. and while Montana does really well with uh, the resources we have, we need to figure out other mechanisms to do that and try to figure out how we can educate kids at a younger age if, if we're going to be serious about innovation in Montana and keeping our people here uh, that want to stay here and live here for their careers. Thank you, Andy. Why don't you go ahead? All right. My expertise is also LGBTQ rights with the nonprofit work I do. Um, so I would like to see the decriminalization of people living with HIV. Um, I would also like, Zoe, so like to see um, non-discrimination 
ordinances, and um, <clears throat> I just lost my train of thought. One second, I'll come back to that. Okay, um, that leads me to mental health care. Um, I've heard mental health care talked about a lot here. Um, one thing I would like to push for is the funding of 988, um, which is a local crisis helpline. It would basically add a couple cents onto one's phone bill. And this would be crisis centers in Missoula, in Bozeman, in Helena, that folks would call similar to 911. Um, so I would like to see the funding for that, and also funding for suicide prevention, because Montana is always in the top three for suicide deaths. This year alone, we've seen 26 suicides in Missoula County. Thank you, Andy. And we are going to now move on to questions from the audience. Oh, we did. Wait, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys. Mental health, right, Andy. Thank you. No, um, please go ahead. Andrea, you're next. Oh. Sorry, I messed up the order to make it more interesting than I. <laughs> That's okay. Well, I think, uh, one, I'm not an expert in anything. I was a liberal arts major and a poverty lawyer, and I have done so many different things. I have a little bit of knowledge about a lot of things, and I fundamentally care and recognize how many of the problems are interconnected. And therefore, I have an incredible difficult time in prioritizing. Please go ahead and look at my legislative bills I've brought. I brought two hearing last session, 20 bills. Now, none of them passed directly, but uh, Republicans did take up them and put them in their bills and learned a lot. Um, I bring bills to solve problems. I did get a bill passed to look at the high cost of air ambulances. It was a study bill that led to four changes in the law. I bring bills to plan. I brought a, a, a bill to do uh, public transportation, a comprehensive study of our public transportation throughout the state. And I brought a bill to uh, look at restoring our egg, um, to really look at soil health. Oh, really? So I have a lot more to say on this subject, and I hope that I get another chance. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Tom, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Education is a great equalizer, and we need to fund education so that it's affordable. Uh, we also need to do something. The state's sitting on a, a, a huge surplus right now, and our cities and towns are struggling, depending on property taxes that, that just aren't sustainable. So we need to look at that seriously. Climate change really is real. It's going to happen. Well, it's, excuse me, it is happening. And most people believe that. And one thing we can do is continue to export electrons from eastern Montana and continue importing dollars. But to do that, we need to change from coal. And it's something that we need to address. And frankly, the market's going to make that happen, is making that happen. And so hopefully we can rally around that and uh, convince some other folks of the importance of that also. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. All right, we're going to shift gears now and take questions from the audience. Let's start down on the end down here, and Bob, you will go first. What can you, how can you work in the legislature to help climate change in Montana, and what action can we take now? So climate change is real. It's not a theory. It's not a question. It's a fact. Uh, Anybody who's been hiking around in Glacier Park for the last 50 years knows that there's only 20-some glaciers left, and, uh, and climate change, folks don't really believe this, but climate change is probably the one thing that could wipe out the population in the United States or the world versus anything else. And for us to have serious climate change, it's going to affect our water, and we're the headwaters of so many other parts of the state. So recognizing that it's a fact and then trying to, uh, I recognize that we're not going to get off gasoline anytime soon, but taking those small steps in order to take energy production from uh, fossil fuels to sustainable is, is the next step to take. And we need to start pushing that and, and encouraging that to happen with subsidies and whatnot. And then uh, figuring out carbon capture ways that we can solve things as well. Thank you. Andy, go ahead. Yes, climate change is real, and I believe Montana should lead the way in this clean energy effort. We need to invest in clean energy now. 
and I think Big Sky, Big Sky Country is a great place to do it. Um, over in eastern Montana, if you've ever been that direction, Great Falls in the east, it's pretty darn windy. So there's a lot of wind energy that we can harness over there. Water and solar as well. We need to move away from the coal energy coming down from Coal Strip and being shipped on our trains to Seattle. Let's move to clean energy. Thank you. Dave, go ahead. Well, climate change is an existential threat to all of us. Uh, we're basically committing suicide uh, as humans if we don't address this. Uh, we need to get off oil and gas as soon as possible. Uh, ways to do that is take advantage of uh, our wonderful country with the wind and the solar. Uh, I've never understood why Republicans don't see this as a great business opportunity to develop more industries uh, and make money in these new clean industries. Uh, they should be on board with it and save the planet at the same time. Uh, so taxing uh, polluting industries uh, would be a priority of mine and then using that tax money to incentivize uh, development in solar and wind and other clean uh, energy development. Uh, we have it in Montana. Let's take advantage of it. Thank you, Zoe. Zoe, go ahead. Thank you. Um, for starters, the climate crisis, as we're drafting legislation, regardless of what that legislation is about, we need to have an understanding of the climate crisis in all areas, because if we ignore it, um, any win is a short-term win. Um, for me, the obviously solar, wind, uh, all that jazz, the thing I want to say about solar um, that strikes close is that um, when I talk to folks in Missoula about it, they said is, it's not just great for the environment, it's also union jobs, local union jobs, because it requires installation and repair, and it keeps those jobs in town and strengthening our community. When it comes to wind, some of the concerns I had about wind, or not I had about wind, but I heard about wind are, what is, how does that impact the communities that put up those wind farms? And to that, I think we need to look into the creation of a renewable energy trust fund, bolster that so that we can incentivize folks um, to invest who might otherwise be opposed to those business solutions. All right, thank you. Linda, go ahead. So I um, also believe we need to capitalize on our natural resources. Uh, and I think we can put things into place like all new builds um, require a certain um, amount of solar panels to supplement um, the energy. Um, and public um, facilities, um, adding those to our, all of our public facilities, whether it's schools, um, fire stations, police stations, hospitals, um, so that we can lower that cost and also promote that. And I think also retraining um, some of our members that, you know, COLA has been their life and that's what they know, so that they can be in this new industry also and they can continue to contribute um, in that field but in a different, more positive way. Um, to deny that this is happening is just um, ridiculous, really. We all know it. We all see it. Um, and some of the people that are that we're seeing this influx of are coming from places where they're seeing those water shortages and they're moving here to get away from that. Thank you. Jonathan, go ahead. Yes, yeah, this is a topic I'm excited about because I'm a graduate from UM's climate change studies minor, so I've talked about this for a while. But I think three kind of low-hanging fruit here is we need to modernize our renewable energy portfolio. We've got to promote net metering policies. We need fully refundable tax credits for renewable energy. What, and I think more broadly, we need to reimagine how we get electricity. I mean, when I think of energy independence, I think it's a very appealing idea that that people's home, that the government should support people choosing to be off the grid, even though they don't live off the grid. I mean, to, to generate your own electricity, and if you're generating more, you can sell it back onto the system. These are things that are. I mean, it's it's for, the market supports it. It's not a it's not a radical idea. And we also have so much opportunity here with all the growth that we're seeing, whether we like it or not, in our cities. We need to make sure that when we're growing that we're thinking about efforts to um, you know, move toward electricity rather than gas. There's a big electrified Missoula um, initiative that I, I think the legislature needs to support. And we also need to think about designing our communities to be 
more climate friendly, public transportation, for example, and think about density in such a way that we don't, you know, that, that our communities will, will promote and align with our climate goals. All right, thank you. Andrea, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I have brought bills already in the legislature to address climate change. Um, the uh, comprehensive study of public transportation was one of those. Um, I agree with what everyone said. We need to address this in a comprehensive way. It's a very real problem. I did bring a, a bill that was a constituent bill. I bring a lot of bills for the people that, and there's a, an organized effort throughout Montana to try to address climate change in a comprehensive way. And I brought that bill and people testified from all over the state. Uh, it did not pass. Um, I brought another bill that was based upon Hawaii looking out their window and saying, hey, we're only a tanker away from uh, not having any power. And they, they made a plan and they started with making a plan. So I brought a bill to get Northwest Energy to tell us what their plan is because Northwest Energy is a regulated utility and government needs to regulate, uh, regulate our energy better. Um, and so, and working together, we can solve this problem as long as we, we have to b believe we can solve it and think big about solving it. Thank you, Andrea. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you. Uh, once again, coal strip one and two are shut down right now. Coal strip three and four are going to shut down due to the fact that the market forces uh, in Washington and Oregon are no longer going to buy that energy. I couldn't figure out for the longest time because when you drive to Oregon, when you drive through Washington, there's a lot of there's a lot of wind uh, wind machines up spinning around. I couldn't understand why the heck they'd want our wind. And somebody finally explained to me the simple fact that our wind's blowing when theirs isn't. So that's a huge opportunity for us. What we need to do is develop that industry, and and once again, we'll have open lines to export electrons and import dollars, and that's what we need to do. We also need to take care of the workers that have worked in Coal Strip for years and years, and there are ample opportunities to do that with new jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. All right, the next question uh, you may have seen in the paper lately, there is a lot of turmoil at the Montana State Hospital and the treatment and care that people have received there. So we'll start, Zoe, with you on this one. What should happen to the state hospital and also then the people who receive services there? How should the care be changed? So I was not part of the crew that went there, um, but what I will say is there is someone here who has written a lovely piece in the Zillion about it. Um, it is a travesty, what's going on there. Um, I think I'm not an expert in this field, I'm not sure what the on-the-ground solutions are, um, but I would defer to the folks who have experience in this area. All right, go ahead, Dave, you'll be next. In my union work, I was lucky enough to visit with some of the staff at the state hospital a number of years ago. This is a problem that's been coming for a long time. Uh, they've been understaffed, uh, they've been um, short-staffed. Uh, many of the employees, I, I, actually I would say most of the employees that work there are solely dedicated to serving their clients and it, it, it just was um, so good to hear that even though they live under um, threat of violence from their clients, they say my job is important. I need to take care of these people uh, because their family needs to know that someone's going to take care of them and we're the ones that can do it. Um, they've been underfunded. We need to really get in there and uh, give them better support uh, and um, that's what it's going to take. Uh, they're dedicated public servants and uh, uh, they need our support and the clients need our support. Thank you, Dave. Andy, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I would basically agree with everything Dave just said, you know, um, I've heard for years that the state hospital is also underfunded. Um, the conditions of the hospital are not up to par. Um, 
and we want to ensure that these Montanans, these human beings, are receiving fair and proper health care, and the professionals giving them this health care are also receiving support and adequate funding. Go ahead, Bob. Back to climate change. Because of the 2017 disastrous fire season we had, and because so much funding was diverted from mental health issues and diverted to towards combating fires and stuff, we still haven't refunded mental health issues that we currently have. And so it's largely a funding issue. Uh, and it's something that flies under the radar of most people because unless you've got a family member, unless you've got a friend that struggles with those types of conditions, you don't recognize it. And it's really easy to push that aside and, and not take care of it. And these are something that we as a society need to prioritize. And uh, that would be my goal is to help prioritize mental health funding and, and go back and try to make a state-of-the-art facility rather than an ignored facility. Thank you, Bob. And now we'll go to Tom. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I agree. We need to fund the state hospital. Uh, the model that that uh, we're looking at and taking folks from there and putting them in the communities, the folks that are able to do that, I think that's a good solution also. Uh, it seems a travesty when we're sitting on millions and millions of dollars in a state surplus that we can't find dollars for those workers and for that facility. The other thing we can do is listen to the folks that work there. They are experts in their field, and they've worked there for years, the ones that are still left. And we can, it, it just seems like it's a simple solution. Instead, we're, we're spending $2.2 .2 million on a study and an organization to, to step in and, and tell us what to do. So once again, those are our friends, those are our neighbors, and uh, we need to treat them with, with respect and care. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Andrea. Thank you. This is also a very important question and one that I have also extensive experience in. I worked at uh, the state hospital as an attorney for the patients there uh, for about four years. I joined, I started there by joining the legal team of, with the ACLU, the Mental Health Law Project, and, and what is now Disability Rights in trying to get back in the 90s appropriate mental health treatment there. It was always a matter of funding, not having enough funding for doctors, not having enough funding for training. And as one of my patients said, hey, if we just looked at this more like a spa and you treated it, and we actually had a real uh, kind of uh, um, treatment away from our communities, we would all probably get better faster. But what's more important is we learned back then that appropriate treatment really means keeping people in the community, doing crisis management and case management, all of which since then that we funded because of the lawsuit, we have started to defund again. So we need to really make a commitment to the most vulnerable um, and, and properly fund this, and also recognize that we're warehousing people there that shouldn't be there. They should be in their communities. So it's a twofold problem, and one that um, I really appreciate uh, Representative uh, uh, Tenenbaum, who's working with the committee now to address it. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yes, I would approach this, uh, you know, from, in two ways. The first thing I think we need to do is sort of stop the bleeding, if you will, and kind of short-term fix in terms of I think a lot of that is going to be funding, in that making sure that the people currently at the hospital are getting the care they need, that the employees have the resources that they need, and then once that comes more under control, I think we need to have, which is already happening, long, so discussions with Democrats, Republicans, stakeholders. Uh, universities to see how can we prevent this from happening again, but then how can we also think about reimagining mental health care, both in the hospital context and more broadly in our communities, to to make sure that we're never in this situation again and that people are, are getting are, are getting mental health care, getting health care in their communities and that we can prevent we can prevent these tragic situations that we're seeing. But I think, you know, funding the state hospital, that's, that's not, a, it shouldn't be a partisan issue. These are Montanans that need health care, and I think that we need to get, get dollars there and get support there. Go ahead, Linda. 
Uh, thank you all for your comments. I think this is uh, a very important topic. Uh, and I think, yes, it, it does go to funding. We have to put, um, we have to put the money there uh, to support the facility, but also to support um, the nurses and the doctors, um, and so that we can attract um, more help also. Um, and also, I, we really need that support in all of our communities. All of our communities are hurting, um, and some of that has to do with housing because we have people that can't afford a house um, that have these degrees and they move away. So all of our counselors have long waiting lists. Um, there isn't enough uh, mental health support in our communities to go around. Um, so I think that it is a twofold and we need um, funding for both of those areas. Great. Thank you. All right, now we're going to have one last rapid fire question before our closing that will have everyone get another chance to talk. This will be 30 seconds, so plan wisely. Once it's 30 seconds, you're cut off. You will, it's a very divisive legislature that we've seen and there are many important issues that we've heard about and we all know about. If you had one bill that you could propose um, with any hope possibly of getting it done or maybe to make a statement, whatever your choice is, what one bill would you propose? And we will start with Tom. 30 seconds. One bill. Let's turn coal strip into a sustainable energy operation that exports electrons and brings dollars into our state, period. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tom. Dwayne Anthony would love that. Uh, now, Andrea Olson, 30 seconds. Yeah, that's just an incredibly unfair question. I could spend a lot of time <laughs> explaining Focus, that. focus, Andrea. What's your bill? I have, uh, I guess I will continue to bring a lot of the bills I'm bringing, but one of the ones that I've been bringing is to restore the right of every person when they're injured at work to be able to choose their own doctor and therefore direct their own treatment. And that's a bill I've been bringing. It's a privacy issue. It's a health care issue. And frankly, it's fundamental, uh, a fundamental right. Great. Thank you, Andrea. All right, Jonathan, 30 seconds. One, one bill. Secure funding to support cities and counties in uh, developing affordable housing. Thank you. Linda, one bill. Uh, I want to put forth um, bills that will um, ease uh, homeowners' burdens and help us fund our public services um, in different ways. All right, thank you. All right, Zoe, go ahead. Oh, oh, how about a pop, oh, please? You have it. You have it. You go. Okay, random fact. Uh, can I squeeze in two if I can do it 30 seconds? One bill, Bob. One bill. Seconds. I would do a procedure and I would make all Republicans and Democrats sit next to each other so you have to get to know someone on the other side and work with them as opposed to having this dividing line between you where you're just throwing bombs back and forth. You can do that in the bars at night at, in Helena. Just so you know. All right, Andy, 30 seconds. One bill. I would put together a bill that would fund 988, which would be a crisis call center um, that folks in crisis could call to seek help. This would address some of the mental health care issues we've been talking about today and dramatically lower our suicide rate in the state of Montana. Thank you, Andy. Dave? One bill, 30 seconds. I'd uh, fund, uh, fully fund public preschool uh, for all because that would help working families uh, and uh, jumpstart our education for younger kids. All right, thank you. Zoe, 30 seconds, one bill. Much of the work on the trans front is on the defense. Um, so the one bill I would propose would be a suite of Airbnb regulations because I do believe that the short-term rental market, both here and in Kalispell and Great Falls and Bozeman, is the number one driver of housing prices and rents going up in our markets. All right, thank you. So now I want to thank all of our candidates for spending your time letting us get to know you better tonight and also thank the audience for participating and for your excellent questions. But before we go, we have one last closing, we have one more question and I have a few announcements. Outside of this room, there are tickets for sale for the Missoula County uh, Williams Dinner, which will take place on June 4th and feature Jennifer Palmieri as a keynote speaker, please take a look if you might be interested in attending. There's also going to be a lovely dinner. It's going to be outside. Hopefully, we'll have great weather. You should come. We can all collaborate and talk then. The other thing is that the primary election will be June 7th. June 7th, so remember that. Please check your voter registration. Make sure you are registered. Don't miss out on a chance to vote. And you can do this at um, 
app.mt.gov slash voter info. And if you're not registered, please register. So that will help you. So now we are going to let the uh, candidates close. And to do this, we will start this time. Linda, we're going to start with you. <laughs> you can do it, Linda. So everyone will take a moment and tell the audience why we should vote for you on June 7th. Um, I, you should vote for me because I am going to advocate um, for my constituents. Um, as um, someone who is a union leader, um, sometimes I have to bring forth things that maybe aren't um, as important on my agenda up because it's important to um, the people that I'm representing. And I will continue to do that. Um, I uh, am a fierce fighter and I stand up for what I believe in. And um, like I said, I will continue to advocate and take care of my constituents and their concerns. Thank you. Jonathan, go ahead. Why should voters vote for you in the contested primary? So, as we all know, we are dangerously close to a Republican supermajority in this state. And we've been talking about a lot of wonderful ideas up here, and I'm supportive of all of them. But the only way that we will, we could even consider not just playing defense and having a legislative session that is worse than what we had last time is if we prevent that supermajority, and ideally if we expand the number of Democrats. And I say this as someone that's all about bipartisanship and working together. We can only be bipartisan and work together when there are enough of us to make some noise and to, and to, to we have to have the numbers to prevent Republicans from doing what we know they want to do. I've been knocking thousands of doors in this race for over a year. And I know that, I, and I'm very confident that I can flip this seat. I think House District 96 might be one of the few seats in this, sta in this state that we really will flip this year to prevent that supermajority, and I am excited, ready, willing, and able to do it. Thank you. Andrea, why should people vote for you? Uh, thank you. Yes, please vote for me. Um, I, I work really hard. I've been in the House for eight years. I was a lobbyist for four years on workers' rights before, uh, for four sessions before that. I have taken specialized training in energy. I have um, traveled the country looking at what other states are doing to address some of these problems. And mostly, I have a really long agenda of many bills that are ready to pass. They're, you know, it takes a while to pass bills, and I want the opportunity to get those passed. Uh, but I'm going to take the rest of my time to say two things. I think I still have time. One, we talked about energy, and nobody said, yay, let's have nuclear power, but that's on the Republican agenda and is in the ETIC meeting which is taking place on the 19th and 20th uh, this week. So please uh, listen to those meetings and uh, voice your uh, opposition to nuclear power as the solution. And I would like to invite, invite you all on election night to give um, politics a dance at the Union Club as a way of bringing all uh, Democrats together to support each other, to have some fun, and to take on the real challenges that we face uh, in the coming years. Thank you, Andrea. Tom, go ahead. You should vote for me for a couple of reasons. One, I believe in government. I think government has the ability to provide for all of us, and that uh, I think we can make government do that. Two, I'm an effective legislat legislator. I've got good relationships with other legislators from around the state and legislative staff. I enjoy working with other members, and I enjoy working as a team. And I think, sincerely, we can move the, the dial and get things done for our state. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Zoe, go ahead. Hi. Um, so for me, the big reason is first-hand experience matters. Um, in a housing market that is an absolute disaster, it matters to have someone who is living that crisis, who has gotten raises, worked good jobs in the community, and still cannot get into the market. That makes a difference. When it comes to health care, it matters to have people rely on health care for their quality of life. As a trans woman, I would be dead without mine. When it comes to LGBTQ rights, as I mentioned, that is the difference between bad bills passing and bad bills not passing. I can build coalitions. I've worked on legislation at the city level. But when it comes down to it, you want people representing your community who are representative of the people struggling with the issues that Montana is facing. Thank you, Zoe. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, my work experience and deep knowledge in history in Missoula 
uh, would be what we need to make headway in uh, a progressive agenda. Uh, Republicans will still outnumber us in the best case scenario, uh, but I want to use my negotiation skills to talk with them, uh, see if we can find some common ground without backing down on our democratic principles. Uh, I would, and if they don't want to work with us, I think if Democrats hang together, we can provide good defense and stop some of these outlandish, unconstitutional bills in the future. I would fight for public education, labor, uh, public pensions, student rights, all human rights, uh, voting rights, and our democracy with a big D and a small d. Uh, I have experience with uh, the union, and uh, that work has shown me that we can stop injustice if we work together and fight for each other. Thank you, Dave. Go ahead, Andy. I hope you'll vote for me, Andy Nelson, for House District 98, because I know and love Montana very much, and I'm going to work my ass off for the people that live here. Um, I believe representation matters, and we need more LGBTQ people working in Helena. I believe we need more younger folks, millennials and Gen Z specifically, working in Helena. I believe we need more renters working in Helena. And that's what I got. Vote Andy. Thanks, Andy. Go ahead, Bob. I have a 15-year track record of advocating for and representing people in our area. And I would continue that for another eight years and then possibly another eight years after that. And with that track record, I think people have trust and knowledge that I'll continue that for them. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Those are all of our questions tonight. I want to say thank you to all of our candidates here for doing such a good job. Let's give them a round of applause. Right? <laughs> it's hard to run for office and it's hard to have a primary because we have such great candidates. So I appreciate your personal experience being in your seats. I, I think we all appreciate you stepping up going forward, and I'd like to thank the audience. Thank you for being here. Hopefully you're more knowledgeable now about some issues. And remember, vote on June 7th. Check your registration. Come to the Mans or not Mansfield. Come to the Williams Dinner on June 4th, and hopefully we'll see you there. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely night. Thank you.